Greetings, I am Wham Bam Duel, and welcome to my explanation of Spell Commander's latest deck profile, the modern Yuma Tsukumo. I highly recommend watching his video first, as this one is meant to go more into depth with some of the choices we made when creating this deck. Starting with this video, I'm actually scripting these explanations. So, starting off with my main deck monster choices, I want to do something else new for these, and start out with the basic outline for the monsters I had when creating this deck. So, these are the rules I kind of had for setting up the main deck monsters. Gagaga -ga -ga Magician and Girl are mandatory. Gagaga -ga -ga was also the Onomat type that Yuma used more than the others, and so it should have more monsters than any other Onomat type in the main deck. I also want to include at least one each Onomat type between Gagaga, -ga, Zubaba, Dododo, and Gogogo -go -go aside from Utopic Onomatopoeia. If I go the route of having Zubaba Bancho Gagaga -ga -ga Coat and Dododo Dwarf Gogogo -go -go Glove count as the only Zubaba and Gogogo -go -go monsters in this deck, which I did, I must have at least one other Gagaga -ga -ga and Dododo monster in this deck to complement them, not counting Utopic Onomatopoeia. I must include some of Yuma's one-off monsters. These ended up being Goblinburg and Kage to Kage, as they're both level 4s that help with swarming. I must include some percentage of Zexel weapons, Zexel servants, and Astral monsters. With those rules working as my outline for the main deck monsters, we can now move on to what I didn't include in that category. First and foremost, there were a lot of Onomat cards that just didn't make this deck especially on the Zubaba and Gogogo -Go -Go side of things, with their only representation in this deck being tied to another Gagaga -Ga -Ga and Dododo -Do -Do respectively. But to be honest, that's mostly just because there aren't a lot of good Zubaba or Gogogo -Go -Go monsters that could have made it into this deck and played well with the other cards. Looking at the Zubabas, there's Zubaba Buster, whose effect is purely related to battle and is a level 3 monster, which isn't going to help Yuma summon any of his main number monsters at all. Zubaba Knight is left off this list for the exact same reason. Zubaba General could have been tossed in with the likes of Gagaga -ga Samurai and Gagaga -ga -ga Cowboy, if not for the fact that its effect in this deck has next to no utility. It detaches a material to equip a warrior from the hand, gaining that monster's attack. Since all of the warrior monsters in this deck of Zubaba Bancho, Goblinburg, the Zexel Servants, Utopic Onomatopoeia, and Astraltopia don't do much for General, and don't even raise its attack above 4000 on their own, I decided that it made this monster completely not worth including. On top of everything, those are the only other three Zubaba monsters in existence. If Konami decides to make some good Zubaba monsters for Yuma at some point, I'd be more than happy to include them. But in total, the Zubabas are reduced to being extremely clunky and ineffective battle tricks, which is why they weren't really worth including beyond the Gagaga -ga -ga monster and Utopic Onomatopoeia. On to Gogogos. There is Gorum, who changes battle position upon being summoned, and sends a Gogogo -go -go from deck to grave if destroyed which would most of the time require your opponent to trigger its effect. It's extremely slow and clunky, like a lot of Gogogo -Go -Go monsters, if I'm being honest. Gogogo -Go -Go Giant summons a Gogogo -Go -Go from the grave on its normal summon, which isn't terrible, but for it to see any use at all, you would need to play a lot more Gogogo -Go -Go monsters than what he currently has. Giant's other effect is entirely forgettable and isn't any reason to include it either. Gogogo -Go -Go Ghost works exclusively with Gogogo -Go -Go Golem, and only triggers upon being special summoned, so it's far less useful than Giant. All Gogogo -Go -Go Golem has going for it is that it is, undeniably, an iconic Yuma card, but with an effect that hardly does anything, it might as well be a vanilla monster, and would be a brick in the vast majority of Yuma's hands, just like the equally iconic Zubaba Knight. Gogogo -Go -Go Gigas is similar to Gogogo -Go -Go Giant, where it does have a useful effect, but only with other Gogogos. -Go -Go it also locks you out of your battle phase, which can be a big annoyance. Gogogo -Go -Go Aristara and Dexio work exclusively with other Gogogo -Go -Go monsters, and have no synergy with Gagagas or Dododos. The effect it passes on to an Xyz monster is also really unreliable, 
as the only way it would be useful at all is if the monster it's used as material for deals piercing damage, which next to none of Yuma's cards do. Gogo -Go -Go Golem Golden Form doesn't help make any plays. It's more of a pseudo-boss monster for the Gogo -Go -Go strategy. One thing that Gogo -Go Go's do have above Zubabas is that they actually have back row, but looking at them, they still leave much to be desired. Gogo -Go -Go Talisman prevents effect damage while two or more Gogo -Go Go's are up, and can once per turn make a single Gogo -Go -Go indestructible in battle. Guard Go is admittedly one of the few pieces of back row in these series of monsters that interacts with multiple types of Onomat monster. The massive downside being that it only works when a Gagaga, -ga -ga, Dododo, -do -do, or Gogo -go -go is destroyed, when usually the opponent is going to be prioritizing Xyz boss monsters with their removal based effects. All in all, Gogo -go -go monsters are extremely self centered and defense focused, with Dododo -do -do Dwarf and Utopicon Monopia being the only Gogo -go -go monsters that want anything to do with other Onomat type monsters. Gogo -Go -Go Goliath is in the side deck only because I was looking for non-Utopian number monsters that could have some interaction and references to Yuma's deck and strategies, so I'm glad it has at least one monster that its effect is useful for in Dododo -Do Dwarf. Now, even though this deck has slightly more Dododo -Do representation with Dododo -Do Witch and Dododo -Do Draw, I'd like to go through the rest of the Dododo -Do cards to explain why they're not here. Firstly though, even though Dododo -Do Witch is a card I have similar complaints to for a lot of Gogo -Go -Go monsters, I was looking for at least one other Dododo -Do -Do monster besides Gogo -Go -Go Glove and Utopic Onomatopoeia to make Dododo -Do -Do Draw more useful in this deck, as Yuma really needs as much draw power and consistency as he can get in this deck. If Dododo -Do -Do Witch is what I'd consider to be the best Dododo -Do -Do exclusive, then you shouldn't have any problem seeing why the rest of the Dododos didn't make it. Dododo -Do Swordsman gains 3500 attack upon being flip summoned, and if flipped face up by any means, he can also destroy up to two face up monsters. This effect is somewhat useful, and kinda funny on a level 4 lower monster like the Hinotama Soulsman from my Shuffle Monsters series, but on a level 8 with zero attack that doesn't do anything else, there's no denying that this card is just bad. Dodo -do Warrior can be summoned without tributing for a stat reduction and negation of opponent's graveyard effects for the turn, which is pretty good, until you realize that it stays as a level 6. If it didn't and became a level 4, I probably would have played this guy over Dodo -do -do Witch. But when it's a level 6 with the only other monster in the deck who can easily get to level 6 being Gagaga -Ga -Ga Magician, I just didn't see a whole lot of use here. Dodo -Do Buster is frustrating for the opposite reason, as it does change its level to 4, but can't just summon itself without tributing. And its only way to achieve its level change effect is to Cyber Dragon itself onto the field, which is only really useful if you're going second in a duel, which can't be guaranteed. This special summoning also works against its other effect, which only works upon being tribute summoned, and even then, still doesn't change its level when being summoned that way. Dodo -do Bot can't be normal summoned, enough said. Dodo -do -do Driver's effect only works if it was special summoned by a Dodo -do -do Monster effect, which in Onomatopoeia admittedly can help with this effect, but even then, it's just a level changing effect in a deck where most of the monsters are already the levels they need to be and there are better ways to get to other levels of monsters when the strategy calls for it. The Dododo -Do monsters come so close to hitting the mark. If only some of them had less frustrating conditions and were willing to work with more than just other Dododo -Do monsters. The perfect Dododo -Do would be something that takes attributes from both Warrior and Buster. It'd be a level 6 who could be summoned without tributing by reducing its attack, then have the option of changing its level to 4 afterwards. Anything else after that would just be icing on the cake, like if it had some kind of graveyard effect floodgate like Warrior, or a revival effect like Buster, except this monster would be able to work with other Onomat types too. With Dododos, we just need more Warriors and Busters, and less Swordsmen and Bots. And then we have the most important Onomat type, Gagaga. -ga. Starting off the Gagagas -ga that were left out, there's Gagaga -ga -ga Gardena, who was a battle trick, and not a very good one at that. 
Gagagamancer is decent recovery. If it didn't lock Yuma to exclusively Gagaga monsters for the rest of the turn, meaning it's only useful for making three of Yuma's Xyz monsters. Gagaga Caesar changes all Gagaga monsters' levels, but since there's got to be a lot of non-Gagaga monsters in this deck, and most of the monsters in the deck are already level 4, which is the main level for the vast majority of Yuma's plays, its effect loses a lot of usability. Gagaga Child summons itself from the hand if Yuma controls another Gagaga and can then copy its level, but it loses the battle phase for the turn, which is a huge drawback. Gagaga Clerk summons itself for free if Yuma controls a Gagaga monster. Not a bad swarming effect, but being level 2 isn't doing this Clerk any favors. Gagaga Tag gives Gagagas a somewhat lame attack boost. Gagaga Academy Emergency Network only works if only the opponent controls monsters, and prevents Yuma from special summoning any monsters outside of his extra deck for the rest of the turn. Gagaga Win's usefulness is diminished by the many other ways to get Gagagas on the field, such as Dododo Dwarf and Utopic Onomatopoeia's effect as well as some of the more generic swarming effects in this deck. Gaga Got Back is a super lame monster reborn. Enough said. Gaga Got Rush, Gaga Got Shield, and Gaga Got Guard are all traps that protect Gaga Got monsters, when Yuma should be focused on protecting his Xyz monsters instead. Even though Shield's effect technically works for any spellcaster, the only non-Gagaga spellcaster in this deck is number 11 Big Eye, a side deck monster. Naturally, Yuma had a ton of other wacky and zany one-off monsters like the Achachas, but I don't think I need to explain why they're not here, especially in favor of the Zexal weapons and Zexal servants that obviously had to be slotted somewhere in this deck. Including Goblinburg and Kage to Kage was already extremely generous on the one-off monster part, and they're only here because they're level 4s who help with swarming. On to the Zexal weapons that didn't get included, we'll start with Unicorn Spear. It only equips to Utopia Ray instead of any Utopia monster, and while each Ultimate Utopia Ray monster are always treated as the original, and the 1900 point boost is one of the highest out of the main deck's Zexal weapons, the effect it gives is super forgettable negating the effects of a monster that the equipped battles during that battle phase only. Keep in mind that Ultimate Leo Utopia Ray can already negate a monster's effects and have its attack indefinitely, and you end up with Unicorn Spear being left out. Slepnir Meryl only works if the equipped Utopia is destroyed by the opponent, so even if its recovery is decent, Zexal weapons are better spent trying to protect a Utopia then make up for their lack of protection with a little bit of recovery. Asura Strike allows a Utopia to attack each opponent monster once, which can get in for a lot of damage, but it offers little else, having one of the weaker stat boosts out of the Zexal weapons. Sylphid Wing can boost a Utopia by up to 2400 attack, but only if the opponent activates a monster effect. It also has a fairly unneeded effect to be sent to the grave in place of detaching material. Considering that the extra deck Zexal weapons give a much better constant attack boost, and that 2400 isn't even far above Eagle Claw's 2000, and this monster ended up left out. Ultimate Shield offers a little bit of recovery upon being summoned, but aside from that, all it offers is a 2000 defense point boost to the equipped monster, with no protective effects whatsoever. Matter of fact, Tornado Bringer and Lightning Blade work better as shields than this monster does, as at least Tornado Bringer and Lightning Blade have protection effects. Phoenix Bow offers a low, by Zexal Weapon Standards, attack boost, and all it does is tack on some burn damage to destroying a monster in battle. Chimera Clad is a dark Zexal weapon from when Yuma and Astral distrusted each other and created the dark Zexal morph which I don't think they'll be recreating anytime soon. The only Zexal Servant left off this list is Vanished Sage, and this monster was only useful to Yuma when he was using Kite's Galaxy Eyes Photon Dragon alongside it. Since he's not gonna have Galaxy Eyes in the near future, this monster's not gonna be useful in the near future. My goals with the spell cards were to include a lot of consistency and draw power, which we can find with Gaga -ga Draw, Dodo -do Draw, Onomatopoeia, Onomatopoeia Pickup, Zexal Construction, Memories of Hope, 
and Xyz change tactics. The other spells in this deck include some removal with Gagaga Ga Ga Bolt, some recovery with Gagaga Ga Ga Revenge and Zexal Entrust, and some other useful support pieces like Zexal Catapult. Shining Draw and Double or Nothing were both considered mandatory, as the former embodies Yuma's Protag powers, and the latter is one of Yuma's most iconic spells. Lastly, the inclusion of some rank-up magics were also necessary. I've already gone through all of the Onomat type back row that was left out, so let's go right into the Zexal back row. Zexal Field is admittedly a great card, but I figured the swarming potential of Onomatopia was more worth it. And while some of these decks do play multiple field spells, it is something I usually try to avoid. Also, while stacking Shining Draw can be useful, it also takes away from the magic of naturally drawing Shining Draw as well. Zexal Alliance is a decent recovery effect, but reducing yourself to 10 life points is cutting it super close. A Utopia monster summoned from the graveyard with this effect will usually have between 5,000 and 6,000 attack, so if the opponent manages to punch over an attack position, or pierce through it in defense position, or remove it with a card effect, it could easily mean the end for Yuma. For the rank up magics that were left out, we'll naturally skip over all of the Raid Raptor, Phantom Knight, and Baryon ones, as well as ones that were clearly designed for or used by other characters. Rank Up Magic Astral Force summons one that's two ranks higher, which is only really useful for ranking up a Utopia into Utopia Beyond, which is even summonable by normal means, and doesn't need to be ranked up into, as Gagaga Ga Ga Sister can turn any level 4 Gagaga Ga Ga and itself to a 6, or Magician and Girl can make their level 6, or Head can be summoned as a level 6 monster and used alongside a Gagaga Ga Ga Magician. Also, its effect to add itself from the graveyard to the hand has a terrible special summon lock to it. Believe it or not, that's the only Yuma-related rank-up magic that was left out of this deck. The rest are all Raid Raptor, Phantom Knight, Baryon, or other character-related rank-ups. As for trap cards, I didn't have too many qualifiers other than I knew I wanted to include Draco Utopian Aura, as well as a couple of Xyz traps. Revenge Shuffle felt like a very Yuma card to include, and Resurgum Xyz feels useful as well. With the extra deck and side deck, I figured the main extra deck would be entirely Utopia based, with the side deck being a whole bunch of other number monsters that have some utility, or were numbers that Yuma won from certain important duels. I also wanted to include all of the Gagaga Ga Ga Xyz monsters, since Gagaga Ga Ga is easily the most recognizable Onomat type that Yuma played. On to the side deck numbers, Big Eye, Lancelot, Force Focus, Volcasaurus, Sanifond, Hard Earth Dragon and Chaos Dragon, Draglubion, and Numeron Dragon all fit into the Utility card category, and Crimson Shadow Armor Ninja, Frieza Dawn, Go 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 Goliath, Volcasaurus, Master Key Beetle, Hard Earth Dragon and Chaos Dragon, and Numeron Dragon, all fall into the lore importance category. Obviously, some of these monsters fit into both categories. With all of the non-rank 4s, I figure they can either be made with Zexal weapon monsters in the case of rank 5 specifically, or can be made with some combination of Gagaga Ga Ga Magician, Gagaga Ga Ga Girl, and Gagaga Ga Ga Sister, who can reach any level from 1 to 10 thanks to Magician and Sister's effects. For the lore important cards, Crimson Shadow Armor Ninja was won from Kaze early on in Zexal, and Yuma helped him repair his bond with Master Roku. Both of them later go on to help Yuma and friends fight against the Baryons later in the series. Frieza Dawn and Volcasaurus were included because the tag duel that Yuma and Shark had against their users was one that really helped strengthen their bond. Additionally, Volcasaurus is an overall solid card. Master Key Beetle is lore important, as Yuma won it from Vector to unlock the different dimension airship from within the Emperor's Key. Hard Earth Dragon, and therefore its Chaos variant, were won from Dr. Faker at the end of Zexal's first arc, and are a reminder of the epic three-way duel Yuma had with Shark and Kite. I don't think I need to explain Numeron Dragon's lore importance. Covering Draglubion real quick, it's a super useful card to have around, as without it, Hard Earth Dragon and its Chaos variant would be nearly impossible to summon. Draglubion is best used to A. Cheat out Heart Earth Dragon from the extra deck with an Xyz material, B. 
cheat out its Chaos variant with the original as material, or C, cheat out Numeron Dragon with a material who will be able to reach at least 9,000 attack points. I'm not going to go over every number monster that wasn't included, but I will go over a select few that people might be questioning. Starting off, I'm just going to say that all of the non-rank 4s that required 3 materials that couldn't be cheated out of the extra deck via Draglubion were automatic no's. Even though Yuma does technically have every number at the end of Zexel, I wanted to exclude a few that felt like they were more fitting for other characters, such as numbers 38, 62, and 90 for Kite, or number 17, 32, 37, and 47 for Shark. Metharian numbers were also excluded, although Draglubion is cutting it close with its resemblance to number 46. Naturally, I'm also omitting all fake numbers and Baryan numbers. Number 22 Zombie Stein was left out because Lancelot, Sanifond, and Draglubion are all rank 8s that don't require exclusively dark monsters and have more useful effects. Number 41, the Stinky Drunk Tapir, doesn't seem like the kind of card Yuma would use in most of his duels. Number 59, Crooked Cook's effect, wouldn't have much use in Yuma's deck. All of number 60, Dugaris the Timeless's effects, have their own sort of representation in the main deck. There's draw power, swarming, and power boosting, without the need to skip any phases. Because I know all you meme lords are going to ask about number 69, I'm just going to say it's only good against other Xyz monsters, and in a modern format, Yuma needs to be prepared to face non Xyz monsters. Number 70, Malevolent Sin, is a fantastic rank 4, but it didn't really feel like it was Yuma's playstyle, and I wanted to focus on some lore important cards as well, as I covered earlier. Number 78, Number Archive, seems like an interesting way for Yuma to cheat out a random number, but then that monster is banished at the end phase, and on top of everything, it also locks his summons for the rest of the turn after using it. Number 91, Thunder Spark Dragon's Detach 5 effect is next to impossible to pull off, and its Detach 3 effect is nothing to really write home about. Number 98, Antitopian, feels like a card that was more meant to be used against Yuma's Utopia monsters, so I can't really see him using this one much either. Number 99, Utopic Dragon, was left out because it's retrain. Number 99, Utopia Dragonar, is far more useful. Then there's all of the Utopia monsters that were left on the cutting room floor. Utopia Prime's effect seems unlikely to ever reach its payoff. Same goes for the original Utopia Ray. I don't feel too bad about not including him, since the ultimate Utopia Rays are always treated as the original anyways. Utopia Rising seems like it was made to be a really odd recovery piece, but everything that it wants to do is better achieved by other cards in the deck. Utopia Roots is just not that useful. Same goes for the rank down magic that was used to summon it. Hopefully, that was all pretty comprehensive reasoning. If there are any other Yuma cards not mentioned in this video that you think I missed out on, let me know. Until next time, I've been Wham Bam Duel, and I'm always happy to see you.